Oh, hold on to your hat. We have a special episode today. A special episode? What makes it so special, buddy? Well, I'm going to bring up the topic of the looming R word. Renee? Yeah, yeah, Renee. No, it's actually the, the R word you don't like me to say. Oh, recession. <laughs> Great. The old recession. <laughs> but hey, listen, before we get into that, I had something happen to me the other day that was completely life-changing and I need to bring it up. Do we really have to? <laughs> we, we do. We do. It's something okay. I never knew about myself, but I discovered and it's pretty damn big. As you're not talking about your privates. <laughs> no, not talking about my privates, I promise. But if, if you know me, you know I've always had a love for Audrey Hepburn. Mm-hmm. And it's no surprise that every relationship I've had over the years, whether it was the grade school crush or the high school sweethearts, including my own wife today, all share that same soft-spoken, polite, caring, but they all had the fair skin, the brown hair usually. And it, that was not on purpose. Just It just happens. And you've made fun of me for that type over the years, which, oh, you know. come on. <laughs> but here's the thing. I'm at my daughter's parent-teacher interviews the other day, and I meet the French teacher for the first time, okay? Mm-hmm. So she is soft-spoken. She's very polite. She's very caring with the kids. And, of course, she does have the fair skin, the brown hair. So later that night, my wife and I, we are out for dinner, and she actually says to me, so uh, that French teacher, huh? She's uh, right up your alley. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, of course. Yeah, great. Thanks. Like, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I get it, Aaron. Uh, she's, she's got an Audrey Hepburn thing going for her. But then Aaron throws the biggest curveball of my entire life. Okay. She says, no, no, not Audrey Hepburn. French teachers. Oh. <laughs> and then in the middle of this restaurant, I have this out of body experience where I'm like sitting in my grade eight French class, looking at my dark hair French teacher who I have a huge crush on. Then I get transported to my grade 10 class, which was even a bigger crush. And again, the dark hair, she's super soft spoken. And then I'm in film school in my 20s. The girl I'm dating, I go to pick her up from her French class. And the professor is like an Audrey Hepburn lookalike. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm in love with the professor. Wee oui, wee. Oui. And then my, <laughs> the school my wife teaches at, her entire French department is made up of mostly women. And they all have a similar look and traits with the dark hair. They're all soft spoken. They're all super sweet and caring. And they're obviously all on my crush list. <laughs> and my wife who fits that same description, soft-spoken, polite, caring, fair-skinned, brown hair. She's a French teacher. So all these years, it's not Audrey Hepburn I loved. It was French teachers. <laughs> and this is important. Why? <laughs> well, it, it's important. Well, you know, if all the French teachers out there, if my wife ever leaves me and you're looking to become Mrs. Boulay number two, you, you still have a chance. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> My French teacher in high school had a crush on me. Does that count for anything? (laughs) This is Taming the Hustle. (laughs) Or something of the sorts. Everybody wants a piece of me. I'm a lonesome man making history. They say we're all just raindrops in a stream. All right, so I, I kind of set you up for what we're going to talk about today. What's new? Well, it's a little bit of a surprise, but I, I said you get upset with me because anytime we see like some type of financial crisis or anything like that, the economy, whatever it is, I use the R word and you always, I, I worry you're going to slap me in the face because you tell me not to say the R word because it freaks people out. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Recession. Yeah, there's really nothing fearful about that word. The reason I hate talking about it is everyone seems to panic. 90% of the people don't even know what a recession is. You're probably right, because I've brought that up to you many times. And you're like, yeah, we're not in a recession. And so what if we are? We'd still be here with a headset on chatting. (laughs) Because I knew you were a little sensitive about the R word. Uh, I thought I'd bring in one of your team members just to help you out, just in case you get cold feet about talking about this. Oh, it's Ryan Duncan. You picked the right guy. You picked the right guy. Baby genius. Baby genius. Hi, Ryan. Welcome to the show. Well, hello, gentlemen. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you. Been really working on my radio voice. Well, that's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I sing a lot of Barry White. <laughs> 
<laughs> which is funny because Ryan and I just spent a week at one of the local mines doing some uh, pension meetings and it really <laughs> creeped out all the, you know, 50, 60 year old miners that are sitting there listening to him and he's doing the old Barry White voice like, well, you know, guys, you should really take advantage of the group RSP. <laughs> Actually, we got some calls because of that. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, I want to talk about what everyone seems to be freaking out about, there's a recession coming. And so I kind of wanted to talk about kind of a little special episode today just because of this R word. And you, as my financial planner, both of you guys, it's one of those things where in the in the past, when any time I've seen the economy or I watch the news and there is a little panic, I obviously call you guys, I ask a question and you guys settle me right down. I think that's why I hate hearing the word so much, Daryl. It's not that I'm fearing a recession. It's just that uh, it's so uh, misunderstood and it's feared for nothing, really. I mean, there are some consequences, of course, and uh, Ryan will speak to that because what we have to make very, very clear is Ryan and I are like the perfect marriage because I have this vision of just so, sort of seeing past all of that stuff because I'm always focused on the client's big picture, whereas Ryan is very, very detail-oriented and he loves to study this stuff. And so he pays attention to the markers, the stats. He looks at the indicators and sort of pays attention to all the trends. And I mean, I'm not ignoring all of those, but he is very, very passionate about the details. And I think that you made a really good call of bringing him on the show today. The, the media has a really big part in all of this as well, too. You know, I often tell my clients, like I wake up at three in the morning and I can't sleep, but I'm not worrying about the recession or the stock market. I'm worrying about my clients' emotions and making sure that, you know, they have the ability to think logically rather than emotionally when we're going through some of this turbulent times. So the one thing I notice, and it's it's kind of funny or, well, really, it's not funny. It's probably more sad than anything is I see friends or family members when this type of thing happens in our economy, they start to panic and they go to their certified financial planner and they always tell me they're like, the first thing I did was I went to my financial planner because I'm pissed off at him or her. And I think, well, why are you mad at them? They don't control the economy. And two, they usually say something along the lines of, well, yeah, I pulled everything I had out of investments and I put it in a GIC because that's the safest way and I'm not going to lose any more money. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like that is the opposite thing you should do. <laughs> so a couple of things, Daryl. So you're absolutely right. I will say, though, that it is subjective. So we, we do very much have to play the emotional side as well because some clients just can't tolerate the downs in the markets. And that's, that is what it is. The GIC rates are so good right now. And Renee can attest to that, that, you know, in 20 years, they haven't been this good. So it's definitely an option. But what I will say is that the... Equity markets and the bond markets are very much seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And we believe that the rebound of those is going to far outperform any GIC that you will have. The potential right now for even the bond market to give you yields of higher than 5% of what current GICs are doing is already there. Plus, we're getting bonds on 85 cents on the dollar. So now you're getting capital gains as well. And to add to that, so when you're seeing a downturn in, in your portfolio, uh, it's just a paper loss unless you have to cash it all in for, you know, a business purchase or a home purchase, then, you know, then you have to talk to your financial planner to see how we can best address that. You know, do you do a short-term loan of some sort till the markets recover? But, but if you don't need the money, like 99% of the people we work with, you know, at very worst, they're taking out a RIF payment every month of three or 4,000 bucks, or, you know, even if it's $10,000, it's all relative, but they're not cashing in their 500,000 or their $3 million portfolio. Yeah. They're just taking out a RIF payment. And, and for the most part, you know, we have clients that are still in sort of a saving mode. So there's really no reason to be worried or concerned. You just got to ride the wave like we've seen umpteen times since we're in business. Well, and that's another question I have is I, I have people who say the, the economy will never recover from this. And <laughs> it's like I, I haven't lived through every recession or economic downturn, but I like to think that every single one that's ever happened has recovered over time. Obviously, it's not going to happen overnight, but correct me if I'm wrong again. I'm pretty much never wrong, I don't think. Do you see how he's dragging his feet there, Ryan, fishing for a compliment of some sort? Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna jump in and say your uh, your wife doesn't doesn't believe that. It's like, fuck. Okay, you're awesome. You're never wrong. Thank Love you, it. Jesus. Is on? that so hard? I got a haircut today. <laughs> no one noticed. I had to bring it up, and now you guys won't tell me I'm right. Jeez. Insecure. You're up and down like the markets. 
<laughs> no, but seriously, at the at the end of the day, it's got to recover, right? Since 1980, we've seen 30 recessions. So a great point oh, Renee wow. said was that, and and you you kind of said it as well, is that the media loves fear, right? Because fear sells. They want the ratings up. So if we get everyone worried about the recession, we start talking about the what if game. Sure, the what if game could look very very uh, drastic and and doom and gloom. But the reality is that 30 recessions since 1980, the annual stock or equity performance in that 42 years has been 10.8%. Crazy. So if you left a dollar in in 1980 and didn't touch it, you'd have 10.8% every year, every (laughs) single year. And that's including uh, 1980, 1987, 1990, 2000, 2008, most recently 2020, when people didn't even realize we were in a recession because it lasted two months. Right. So I'm not going to sit here and, and discuss what a recession is because I'm not an economist. And even among economists, there's different metrics to determine what a recession is. What I will say is that it's not as dirty of a word as that it should be made out to be. This is to add to what Ryan commented about the 2020 correction is that the pandemic hit and we had such a very rapid downturn in the market And then such a rapid turnaround that most people didn't even notice it. And that's mostly because they didn't see it on their quarterly statement. That's how simple it is. Because it was a faster and greater downturn than we're seeing right now in 2022. But we did not have nearly the same amount of stress and concern. And it's because people were actually seeing it on paper. Whereas in March of 2020... It had pretty much recovered before their quarterly statement. So by the time they got something on paper, it didn't look nearly as bad as what it actually was. So that is proof of how emotional this whole thing is for people. So taking your money out completely and stuffing it under your mattress is idiotic. That's that's too panicked. If you do that, can I have your address? <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing. I want you you two guys <laughs> can i can i can i say something for the record though i might cut it out but yeah for people <laughs> for people who say use guys can we please stop saying use, use guys because <laughs> you can never have an s at you that i didn't say it did i no you didn't but it just <laughs> that when God. you're like you guys <laughs> i often hear how are yous doing no use. there's no s there <laughs> no s <laughs> nope that's not english <laughs> no <laughs> Me fail English? That's impossible. Hey, you's worried about the recession? (laughs) Actually, so just coming back to what you said a minute ago, Daryl, I want to bring this back up is that like Ryan and I right now are pretty much just massaging emotions full time. And this is just to reassure our clients that, you know, the investment strategy we put together is reflective of the financial plan that was designed for them. And that it was built to stand the test of time that there's really no reason for us to panic. I mean, it's impossible for us to always be in a positive territory. These corrections happen. So, and what you were saying earlier about the corrections in the market is that they always come back. Well, you know, my analogy is I've been in the business for nearly 25 years and I've gone through multiple corrections like this. I've gone through multiple recessions. And every time that I would speak to a client that was panicking, whether it was during the tech bubble burst in 2000, financial crisis in 2008, or the pandemic in 2020, and now with the pandemic, with inflation concerns, with uh, the war in Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera, is everyone says, well, this time it's different. We're screwed. We're fucked. Like this is, (laughs) you know, Armageddon is happening. We don't know anything about technology. You know, we just went through the Y2K. We're screwed. In the U.S. in 2008, (laughs) the U.S. economy is the largest economy in the world and it's collapsing and we're doomed. The one thing that always, always happens is regardless of the reason, which will always be different because our economy, the world itself is just always evolving. The one thing that all uh, corrections have in common is that we get through it and markets recover. Renee just gave you the lowdown of, of the big picture of the macro economy. But on the personal side, people often forget that it's just Renee and I. But behind us, we have a team of portfolio managers and equity analysts who are going through each and every portfolio to make sure that they're properly structured for things like this. You forgot to mention you have a marketer behind you as well. <laughs> we also have. It's very important. I'm just very saying. Big marketer. 
<laughs> Whenever you're behind us, we always get the little the little cheek squeeze there, so we try to avoid well, that. A, at it's all a tap costs. on the butt, like the football coach. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just like, come on, guys, let's go huddle. It's unfortunate you call HR all the time when I do that, but whatever. HR is my wife, <laughs> and she does not side with me. There is no benefit to me calling HR. So, if you could educate people today, like, give me a Cole's Notes version of how to educate. So, when I have a buddy who is literally losing his hair, freaking out about what the news keeps saying is uh, the recessions it's knocking on our door what can he do smell opportunity because a recession is a normal part of the economic cycle it creates a lot of opportunity for good quality companies to continue to do their thing so with that being said it is eliminating a lot of the the fomo companies i'll call it where the fear of missing out and everybody started investing in them like gamestop for example which very much irritates me <laughs> um <laughs> But for the companies like Amazon and Microsoft and Apple, you know, those companies are going to be around for a long time. You know that they have good business practices. And the reality is, is that the portfolio managers and the analysts are working behind the scenes to jump in and out of those positions. And they're also moving into more defensive positions. So we plan for all situations. We take a look at the portfolios and we break them down and we say, will company A do well in this situation? And will company B do well in this situation? And what that does is make sure that you're covered on all bases so that in scenario a yes okay this fund isn't doing as well but fund b is going to do better so so on top of that daryl we're also breaking down on the individual equity portion or your stocks that you own is that we're moving more positions into defensive positions meaning that you know in a recession or in times of economic downturn you're still going to take a shower you're still going to need your medical supplies. Yeah. So those are companies like Johnson Johnson or Enbridge, for example, where you might not need a Bowflex. You might not work out or buy the $3,000 piece of equipment. Now, Bowflex isn't the only example, but... Yeah, but you can go out for a run. So if your wallet's tight, you may go for a run with the sneakers you already own and it's going to cost you nothing. So a company like Bowflex may have sort of their sales affected, whereas you still need dish soap, you still need shampoo and all of the essentials. Still need baby formula. Yeah, for sure. Proper diversification is so important. It doesn't mean you have to run for the hills every time there's a downturn in the market. You just have to be well prepared for it. And I think that, you know, seeking the right advice and having some people on your team like ourselves could be a game changer. So, hey, let's take a little break. Ryan, I want you to stick around. I want to jump on this uh, this recession train because I think it's just fun. It's really fun to play with people's emotions, don't you? No, no, not at all. You forgot my takeaway already. You're like a squirrel today. <laughs> hey, when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about how to survive with your business during a recession. Or maybe I won't say that word. Find out when we get back. If the news has taught us anything about investing, it's more than just jumping on a bandwagon. Discover a better financial return while making a positive impact on the world. Hashtag call Renee, responsible investment specialist of St. Cyr & Associates. Welcome back. Um, so I, like I said, I want to talk about survival basically, because we often hear this, we heard this during the pandemic, whenever the economy takes a hit and with, again, the news telling us a recession is looming, every business owner once again, scrambles trying to figure out ways to survive. And they always say, what am I going to do? Well, there are a handful of things you can do. You know, like I look at during the height of the pandemic, um, our clients who listen to us, they increased their marketing and advertising and they started to thrive. And I know that sounds like me trying to sell my service here and it's really, really not. Like you can attest to this, Renee, we had the conversation early on during the pandemic where you were like, no, we keep going as we go. I got to tell you, you're dead on just like your emotions with the stock market. Your portfolio is down. If you have money, get in, man. There's opportunity, just like Ryan mentioned. Exactly. Same thing with your marketing strategy. You got to strike when the iron's hot. You got to take the opportunity when opportunity presents itself. Exactly. And it's, it's whether it's paid advertising or you just take a look at your organic social media and taking it to another level, right? The key here is not to hide during hard times, but you got to come out like swinging. The easiest thing for us to do in our business would be to try to hide during these times. Exactly. Our job is to be in your face, letting you know you're going to be okay. Your marketing strategy should be the same regardless of the industry you're in. Exactly. And I, I've said this before and I'll say it again. Your business, no matter what it is, you are there to solve a problem for your customers. Plain and simple. That is why you are in business. 
And one of the biggest things you can do is to look around what your offering is and to find that one thing that you sell and literally promote the fuck out of it during this. So Daryl, in these times, would you say that companies should stick to what they're currently doing? Like, do they continue promoting the same way that they've been promoting? Or No, you, you have to tweak it, right? So for example, let's say you're a restaurant and your specialty is steak. You're a steakhouse. Your prime rib is your bread and butter. That's what everybody comes to you for because it's the best thing on earth. But during or leading up to a recession, for example, you're finding that the return on investment of your advertising just isn't cutting it, right? Because you're spending more, but not a lot of people are coming for that $54 prime rib. So even though your hamburgers, for example, are the lowest price item, and it could be your least favorite thing. You're like, our hamburgers aren't really that great. Make it great. Yeah. First, make it great. But pick your slowest day. And you're like, you know what? Tuesdays are our slowest day and advertise them and make a deal on them. Say, you know, maybe it's a free drink or even change the name of it. Maybe on your menu, it's called the quarter pound burger. But now it's the big tasty combo Mm. because you want to make it sound special. So your advertising comes in for our deal of the week and try our new big tasty quarter pounder all beef burger with homemade fries and your choice of beverage for $16.99. Now, for someone who's pinching pennies at home because they've been watching the news, freaking out, going out for a night for a $54 prime rib is not doable. But going to a nice fancy restaurant or just a nice restaurant in general and paying $16.99 for your meal, even though it's a burger, still feels feels like a great night out, right? We can do expensive ketchups like Dijon ketchup. (laughs) But the cheap night out, right? And that solves the problem. Because people want something great. And so, Ryan, you brought up the the financial crisis of 2008. And one of my favorite stories from that is Airbnb. So they heard people bitching and pissing and moaning that travel was not affordable. You know, we're losing money. It's not going to work. I can't go on my vacation. I can't do this. So the creators of Airbnb sat back and said, let's solve that problem. And they created an app. They created this website. And the next thing you know, people are renting out someone else's cottage or a condo with a, or a home with a pool. And they're getting away at the fraction of a price. And again, solving problems. Such a great story. I don't know if you guys listened in on the um, how we built this podcast and they had the founder on. Oh, my God. I love it. I love those success stories. The last thing I want to touch on is something that I used to do when I worked in film and television and creating budgets. There's this one line item that's in every budget in TV and film called the contingency budget. And sure, every business says I am saving for a rainy day, but in reality, most businesses don't. And and I get it. If you haven't saved up until now, it does feel hopeless as a business. But a good rule of thumb, whether it's a recession or not, is five to seven percent of every dollar you earn goes into your contingency fund and is never touched. And here's the thing that I really want you guys to uh, kind of touch on is if you have a certified financial planner in your back pocket and you have this contingency fund, it doesn't just sit there dormant. So Daryl, we call that an emergency fund in, in our line of work. And and we truly believe in having one. It's a little bit more subjective than the 5 to 7%, but we full-heartedly put our emergency money into something like a high interest savings account. For example, Manulife Bank right now is at 3.5% on your cash with no risk to the markets at all. Nice. So it's really a no-brainer to put that in there and just leave it and kind of forget about it. Yeah, great great plug on Manulife there, uh, Ryan. Yeah, they're uh, they're actually, uh, we're now monetizing this, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honestly, this podcast was kind of created around this concept because nearly every conversation Renee and I would have about advertising and marketing eventually led into and merged with finances. Oh, no kidding. And it always seemed to like be intertwined. And that's how it came to be. It's like, you know, just because you're saying this is a, a, you guys call it an emergency fund, I call it contingency fund, whatever you want to call it. If you're saving money and you're not talking to a certified financial planner about this, you could be gaining more money, which helps you when this happens to pay somebody to keep your business open, right? There is no benefit to stick in your head head in the sand, right? You have to be prepared. Ignorance is not bliss in this case. No, exactly. So long story short, find a product or service that solves a problem for those tight with money. That's how you survive any financial downturn. It's that simple. Listen, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, you know how we have our, our last piece, which is always kind of our lifestyle piece. I want you two to put yourself in the shoes of, let's say, somebody sitting at home watching TV How do you actually manage your emotions? How would you guys do it? We'll find out when we get back. 
What's ESG investing? It's considerations of environmental, social, and corporate governance into the investment process. Dude, I'm 10. Let's say it's being responsible to the world with your investments. <laughs> sure. Hashtag call Renee, responsible investment specialist of St. Cyr and Associates. Oh, I, I like that ad. That's one of my favorite ones, I think. You know what? You create some of the greatest ads, dude, that it's really hard to find a favorite one. Yeah, I just said that because they're all my favorite. They're like my children, right? I, you have to always say they're my favorite when it's the only one around. Aren't they your children? <laughs> <laughs> Literally the voice of your children. That's so true. Okay, listen, I want to know how... Okay, we're, we're going to use me as an example, okay? I'm sitting at home. I'm watching the news. I'm freaking out about this possible recession. I own a business. Uh, we're going to pretend I'm not a marketer. And I'm trying to figure out how to stay afloat. I'm stressed. I'm losing my mind. What do I do? Tell me right now. Masturbate extensively. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why Ryan will rule the world. No, Daryl, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Renee take that one because he's been around the block. And, he's masturbated a lot. Yeah, I know. He's masturbated a lot, but I'm gonna let him take that one because I'm still learning how to deal with my own emotions. So, which is <laughs> really away. funny because, like, I this is all I know, right? This is all I've ever done. Cool, calm, and collective. So Ryan's been with us for some time now, but this is his first like major correction where we have to really address, you know, and have conversation with clients. And at the beginning, like in the spring, he was almost making me anxious and he was super stressed out about what was going on. And then I'm like, fuck, that was me in 2000. Yeah. And you just have to take the emotion out of it. And I know that's really difficult, but for training sure. your brain to think logically is probably 90% of what we're doing with our clients right now. I try to develop that skill set for my own emotions, right? Whether it's something that you're going through in your personal life or your work life or whatever is like, okay, take how this makes you feel and think logically about the situation. Is it really worth stressing about it? Because most of the things that we deal with in life, uh, whether we stress about it or not, and I stress, I'm not I'm not going to say I've got this mastered. I stress out about stuff. But when you look back at it, you realize that stressing about pretty much every situation will not change the outcome. For sure. And that's how I remind myself sitting in front of the TV, watching the news and saying, you know what? This really sucks. And this is the last thing that I want happening for my own portfolio, for our clients' assets, and for the economy and the well-being of, you know, our friends and neighbors all together. But stressing about it is not going to change anything. Can, can I just ask, when you said, uh, I'm going to quote you here, I, have a, I do have stress in my life. I won't pretend I don't. You kind of gave me a look there. You talking about me? <laughs> I don't know, other than your nervousness of having handsome Ryan on the call with us today. Uh, oh, that's not what he calls me in private. <laughs> uh, I, I love my time with you and you actually don't cause me any stress. I, uh, I'm not trying to sell you here, bud, but uh, the, what you bring to the table for my team and I takes a ton of stress away from my life. I just let you do your thing and I don't even worry about it, so. I don't know. When we're flying together, you tell me to stop talking. I think I stress you oh, out a well, little bit. Oh, that's a different story. You fucking talk way too much. I just, it, there is, it is exhausting to spend any length of time with you. No, I'm not going to lie about that. All right, guys. Hey, listen, thank you for this. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, whether we help one person or a million, I just think it's important that people understand what's going on and the level of panic just doesn't need to be part of your life. And that goes for what you guys were saying. That goes for what I was talking about. And I think this is, I call it a special episode, even though it's not, uh, we're, we're not on a different day or different time. I think it's special because it allows people to connect and kind of get inside our heads and understand what is going on realistically. Well, I appreciate you guys having me. You're so soft-spoken. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. You're awesome. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye.